So I'm delighted to be here and talk uh, on a topic that I've written on at least once in the past and uh, expand upon uh, in various ways as we go ahead. So um, about 2,500 years ago, the early Greek philosopher Plato, in his dialogue Charmides, wrote as follows. If someone claims to be a doctor, how can I tell if he really is one? That was a long time ago, but Plato's problem re remains highly relevant today. In our relatively more advanced, or at least complex, societies, people often feel, reasonably enough, that they don't know as much as they need to know uh, as they traverse various problems and challenges in life, whether they be humdrum or severe. They feel a need to consult experts who can perform various operations for them, ranging from fixing a damaged automobile, performing a serious piece of surgery, or guiding them in making various investments. In each case, they may ask the question, with whom should I consult, and who can I trust most to help me with this problem? Suppose one aims to launch a startup company, but needs a tech specialist to run its digital arm. Whom should you choose uh, for that job? Uh, in each case, one looks uh, for someone with an appropriate kind of expertise. In all of these cases, I'm assuming the, what I'll sometimes call the seeker, that is the one who's trying to get the help, uh, of expert help uh, lacks the appropriate expertise of his or her own. They don't have it as of the time in question. Uh, he is a novice, he or she is a novice, whoever is the seeker, uh, who candidly recognizes his own or his or her own lack of the skill needed to cope with the challenge in question. However, the question then arises, how can such a seeker figure out which of the available candidates for the job is the best one? Which, would, which one should be chosen? Well, for present purpose, I mean, it might be, of course, a matter of what's the cost of each one. But for present purposes, I'm going to ignore differences in the fees that might be charged and focus on the more intellectual parts. So how can a seeker tell which of the various putative experts would really be good and which would turn out to be a mere fraud or duffer? Before proceeding, we must ask, what does it take to be an expert? I mean, we want to know what expert somebody should consult, but what does it take to be an expert in the first place in one or another field or area? Of course, a person might be an expert in one field, but know nothing about another field. But we're talking always relative to some relevant field or topic in question. Um, so we're not interested in enumerating all the different fields of expertise, which of course are legion. Rather, we are interested in the general idea of expertise. What in general does it take to qualify as some kind of expert? So here are two different possible answers that are given. Uh, one is what I'll call the reputational approach. An expert in some field is someone who enjoys a reputation, at least in some circles, for being knowledgeable and or skillful in the special specified field. A different approach, at least slightly different, but maybe importantly different, is what I call the realist approach. Uh, an ex in this sense, an expert in some specified field is someone who genuinely possesses appropriate knowledge and or appropriate skills to answer and or resolve the kinds of questions or problems that uh, are appropriate to the field. So with respect to knowledge, for example, an, exa uh, an expert commonly would be somebody who surpasses most other people uh, in being able to correctly answer factual questions that might arise in the specified domain of expertise, or if asked how to solve a problem, would have the ability 
uh, in the relevant field to, uh, to specify how to solve the problem. So he or she would be good at going about and solving it. And that could be a very intellectual activity or something somewhat different. But that'll tend to be my more standard example. Uh, now, this very general characterization of expertise is intended to apply, as I said, to a very wide range of fields, including natural sciences, medicine, automobile repair, uh, finance, uh, music history, and so on and so on. Now, although a high level of knowledge is central to being an expert, I think, the types of knowledge in question are not uh, restricted to narrowly intellectual subjects or highly intellectual subjects in some abstract sense of intellectual or some sense of abstract thinking. Uh, that's not essential. Um, so that's concerned with what it is uh, or isn't a fact. Um, it is also associated with the ability, as I already said really, to produce actions and results such as curing a physical ailment or uh, designing a profitable investment plan, to take just two examples. <laughs> as between these two approaches um, to expertise uh, mentioned above, reputationalism and realism, I side with realism. Now, I won't spend any more time in trying to argue for why that's better, but that's the one I'm going to stick with, OK? Uh, Sorry, you can't do everything <laughs> in, in one evening. Uh, being an expert doesn't require a reputation for possessing a high level of knowledge and skill. One could be an, I uh, hope that person's okay. Um, uh, one, one can be an expert, certainly under the definition of uh, the realist definition, but I think that makes it a good feature. Um, so one can, be an expert even if he or she keeps this knowledge and skill private, never displaying, for example, credentials or handing out uh, a, a single to advertise his or her skill uh, or accomplishments. Still, the person might have the knowledge, have the intellectual and other skills that can do the job, and that's sufficient to being uh, an expert and necessary. So, okay, now I turn to section two following that introduction. Um, and this concerns the possible methods that a seeker of help, someone who seeks help from a, an expert or somebody they th consider a possible expert. Um, so how are you supposed to identify uh, somebody uh, as a superior expert? Because as I said, you don't want a duffer to be your expert. So here we focus on the question of how to identify the best experts when we're assuming there are two or more who are competing for the job, as it were, or for uh, being uh, used by the uh, seeker. So here's a, a short list of possible methods that one might use, the seeker might use to pick out the better and the best of the available experts or putative experts. So the first method is appealing to training and credentials. So putative experts uh, have commonly deceived, re sorry, received specific training uh, that led to their claimed expertise. They may have, may have studied at a university, a technical institute, or a law school, et cetera. They will often have licenses or certificates to display in their office. Our seeker might compare these certificates as indicators of the relative quality of uh, the, the competing experts. But how much information can a layperson, and that's what we're assuming that our novice is a layperson, I mean, that's what makes the whole thing interesting because there, that's the person who doesn't have the skills and knows it and therefore is consulting an expert, somebody else. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing that does arrive, not infrequently in life. So that's the kind of problem we're looking at. 
So how much information can a layperson uh, extract by reading such licenses or certificates? A seeker may know little about the relative strengths of different institutions or schools. So learning that this one was trained at one place and the other was uh, trained at another, how much help is that in identifying which one would be superior, particular for the, for the job at hand? Uh, and if two competing experts were trained, um, so that, that's uh, one problem. Uh, and if two competing experts were trained in the same institute, it would remain unclear who was the cleverest or most insightful to come out of it. So, um, well, we'll just leave it there. Finally, even reading evaluations that many people who have employed these consultants, so somebody says, well, just I did such and such a job for so and so and so on, so consult them. Uh, that still, who employed, uh, so let me start again. Finally, even reading evaluations uh, made by people who had employed these consultants would be of questionable help. Such evaluations are sometimes found, evaluations in various fields, sometimes found in online resources like Yelp that you may be familiar with. But such evaluators are sometimes paid to deliver glowing reports, clearly unreliable information. So you don't know who, who and what to trust when you're trying to get information on the candidates. Patients' evaluations of doctors might be rather unhelpful for different reasons, especially when the patients themselves lack medical expertise. They may find some evaluations uh, merely based on bedside manner. So if they've just watched or heard the opinions of people who've had that doctor and was very pleased with the doctor, still those judgments might rest more on, for example, something that's really irrelevant, bedside manner, rather than the more difficult task of finding a telling who could give a successful cure for a challenging condition. So anyway, I think it's not often not that easy to find out who's the relevant and more uh, reliable expert. So now another possibility is what I call appeal to the numbers. Confronted with the limited value of the foregoing types of information, a seeker might check to see if other specialists hold the same opinion as the first one encountered. If, you know, is this person agreed to by a lot of other people who are in the same field? If many of them agree with the advice of expert one, I suppose there are two experts, one and number one and number two, and many of them agree with number one, whereas only a few concur with expert or putative expert number two, isn't it obvious that number one should be selected? So you should go with the views of the experts about which, which one they agree with or which one they find most uh, impressive, etc. Unfortunately, matter, matters again are not so simple. Here, here's why. Uh, the two groups of uh, advisors um, may be the products of two different training schools. Suppose each group, each group slavishly follows his or her own training school, and so they all wind up with similar views and similar ideas about what should be done in certain circumstances. It just so happens that one school has more students and produces more trainees. And so there are going to be more of them agreeing with number one, say, rather than number two. But that may be more because <laughs> that there are more of them uh, rather than uh, that they are um, the better ones the ones that are, they select or agree with. So this, is, this other uh, phenomenon is what accounts for the numerical difference in response to the question at hand as to which of the experts is better. 
The larger number, however, doesn't prove that the group is more trustworthy uh, than the other. That largely depends on which school gives superior training to their students. Appealing to the larger number only has merit when the, the different consultants are independent of one another, and here they aren't dependent because they're, because they're slavish followers of the same training program. So the significance of independence can be illustrated by another example. Suppose that Jones is a juror in a trial. He hears, a wit he hears a witness number one testify that he personally saw Schmidt commit the crime. This lends some initial support to Schmidt's guilt. Next, Jones hears witness number two also testify to Schmidt's guilt. But witness two doesn't personally witness the crime. He only heard about it from witness number one. So should this additional testimony strengthen the evidence for Schmidt's guilt? No. Witness two's evidence is not independent of witness one's evidence, so you're not really getting more information. And so it doesn't really support in the way you might have thought. OK, um, so that's several candidate ways of going about trying to identify a better expert. OK, but here's another way it might be possible to make progress. And I suggest that perhaps the most helpful method, when available, uh, to, to determine who's the better expert, or the superior expert, is to seek what I'll call past track records, that is, records of what the individual did and how successful it was, of the candidate's expert. Um, so how often did he or she give advice that actually resulted uh, in an improved result? How well did each expert prove himself or herself in the test cases? A track, a track record consisting of a large percentage of success and few, if any, failures would obviously be a prime indicator of a candidate's expert quality. But is it feasible for the layperson, the seeker, uh, to verify past track records of multiple experts? This depends, of course, on the kinds of tasks or problems the experts in question tried to tackle and the answers or solutions they proposed. What layperson, but would a layperson be in a position to assess, to assess adequately those solutions. Consider another medical example. Suppose a seeker learns that five years ago Dr. Jones was confronted with the following problem. Patient Johnson suffered from symptoms X, Y, and Z. What would be the best way to treat his condition? Suppose our seeker wishes to use this information to address Dr. Jones's qualifications. Can he find out what treatment Jones delivered? Well, that seems pretty clearly possible. But will our seeker be able to tell whether Jones's treatment was really sound? That's unlikely, at least given the seeker's lack of medical information. Of course, the seeker might learn that patient Johnson eventually recuperated from his condition but that wouldn't provide sufficient guidance concerning the quality of Dr. Jones's diagnosis and or treatment of patient Johnson. After all, um, the patient might have recuperated all by himself. One might not be able to tell. Uh, I don't wish to argue that appeal to past track records are a fruitless method for dealing with our phenomenon. As indicated, I think it's actually a pretty good method uh, when used properly. It may often be the best method available. Here's an example. Oscar is untutored in matters of astronomy. He hears Sidra claim that there will be a solar eclipse over London precisely one year hence. 
by itself, this doesn't provide Oscar with any evidence that Sidra has astronomical expertise because Oscar hasn't yet a clue, hasn't a clue as to whether Sidra's prediction will turn out to be right. Okay, but suppose Oscar waits a year and personally observes a solar eclipse in London, precisely as Sidra predicted. This would be evidence of expertise uh, of her, uh, on her part, assuming that she didn't learn about such a prediction from somebody else who, who is an expert in the field. The point is that there is a legitimate example, here we have a legitimate example of how a novice can go about getting support for someone else's expertise uh, without transforming himself or herself into an expert in turn. Okay, to summarize, I'm not claiming that good evidence uh, for various individuals' expertise is beyond the grasp of laypersons, not at all. However, such evidence may be rather difficult to acquire, uh, which is not to deny the value of using such evidence wherever this is feasible. Okay, now I turn to section three, which is taking account of the expert's interests. So an, ind an independent additional factor to consider, of course, is the self-interest that an expert might have uh, in, rec in recommending one way of addressing a problem rather than another by, for example, getting kickback from choosing one investment uh, outfit rather than another. Which expert to choose for a given task might not depend wholly on how knowledgeable the expert is, but on the trustworthiness of the expert in giving advice. So other things equal, one should, I think, it avoid an excess, uh, an, an expert who clearly has a significant self-interest in a topic. I mean, that's not necessarily a killer, but it's obviously a kind of thing to consider. Okay, here's an, uh, another section dealing with mistakes that are sometimes, uh, would be appropriate to look out for uh, because some relevant investigators have found mistakes being made in reasoning that might apply to these kinds of problems. So psychologists and other students of cognition identify an assortment of what they call biases or errors in thinking and reasoning in general. And some, some of these would apply to decisions concerning whom to trust as an expert. For example, Listeners are often blown away when speakers, uh, that is, blown away, that is, impressed by, uh, <laughs> etc., uh, when they, when speakers assert things with striking force and self-confidence. Uh, listening, uh, listeners often seem to assume that speakers. Um, as self, that self-confidence is a reliable sign of authoritative knowledge. In fact, however, these, so these investigators report, uh, assert, assertiveness and swagger does not, are not reliable indicators of truth possession. In fact, the psychologist Philip Tetlock reports the following experimental finding from his lab. The experts who are most often accurate in our studies are cautious, quiet, and somewhat more boring. So if you want to identify a genuine expert, you may be better off choosing a cautious character rather than a super confident one. Okay, here's another kind of bias that they some of these psychologists cite. This is confirmation bias. This is confirmation with a I, confir, F-I-R-M, et cetera. Psych psychologists Lord, Ross, and Lepper report the following bias. People tend to take at face value 
any evidence that confirms their prior beliefs, what they antecedently believed, while subjecting evidence that disconfirms prior beliefs is, in, uh, is intense critical evaluation, so a very different kind of stance. So now I turn to something that has a slightly similar uh, title, conformation bias, that is uh, following, conforming to other people, to what you see them do or believe. Okay, so another common error people tend to make, at least, I'm not sure I want to join the the label of error here completely, but I'm reporting to you what many of the psychologists say in this kind of uh, vein. Uh, it's a common error of people to tend to make a trust, to make, is, sorry, let me start again. Another common error is tending to trust others whom they haven't really a good reason uh, to trust. Uh, psychologist uh, Solomon Ash, some years ago, devised an experiment in which a group of eight participants, try to imagine some eight participants, or groups, uh, who were shown a card while one line on the left, with one line on the left, and three lines of different lengths, all different than all three, uh, on the right. Their task was to identify which line on the right was of the same length as the line on the left. Now, meanwhile, seven members of the group, a different group, were, were confederates of the researcher. And they were instructed to choose the same wrong line. Okay, so they're, they're making the wrong choice. The subjects then are asked to give their own results and um, they could either agree with the rest of the group, which would be picking the wrong line, or pick the right line. A significant number of subjects chose to go against the evidence of their own senses about the relative lengths, and in, and in order, apparently, to conform with the other group members who they'd already seen give a different answer. Okay. So this highlights the pitfalls of following or conforming with the crowd. Now I turn to section five, which is choosing between bodies of experts and a skeptical citizenry. So now we're turning from individual seekers or novices who are trying to uh, get help from uh, experts and turning to groups of people of some sort, some sort of social groups. So in all the preceding discussions, the focus has been on the situation of a person with a problem who needs the guidance of the expert, but finds it difficult to decide which putative expert is the best or most reliable. So in this new section we're starting, we consider a different kind of problem involving experts. It is a case where there is a firm body of experts who agree that a certain type of action is desirable. In addition, there is a body of citizens who question or deny that this kind of action is desirable. What action should be adopted by the untutored citizenry? So there's, there are already actual bodies of uh, contrasting opinions that exemplify such disputes even in the most advanced countries, such as, well, I guess you gotta include the United States and England, uh, so we'll include them here. Uh, so which group is being unreasonable in what follows, and how have they, might they have gone wrong? So here I've grabbed a, a discussion of this, of the problem of uh, anti-vaccine, uh, which is found both in England and in America. So, and uh, a writer, Jan uh, Hoffman, had an article um, entitled, How Anti-Vaccine Sentiment Took Hold in the United States. And some mention of how there were kind of contributions here, too. Uh, maybe even earlier. Uh, in uh, August of 2019, the United Kingdom lost its World Health Organization designation as a country that had 
eliminated measles. So it had had that uh, designation because they had very good score of getting vaccinations. Uh, because, but because, um, because of out, outbreak this year. But, so they were predicted at the rate they were going to lose that uh, status. And the same thing is about to occur in the United States. So the two countries are really more or less on the same path, it's, it appears. Uh, it is about to, uh, in, in, both, uh, in both countries, this has happened because of what uh, has been labeled vaccine hesitancy. So the World Health Organization lists vaccine hesitancy as one of the top threats to global health because when uh, vaccine, uh, regular vaccine practices go bad, that is, lose, lose um, the, the level that's needed, then a lot of uh, problems arise. So this represents a reversal of the public attitude toward vaccination, which had previously, in both countries, followed the dominant position of medical science. Now, how or why has this, been, has this happened, uh, especially recently? Uh, it's, uh, so let's see what uh, Jan Hoffman says uh, in her article. Um, Hoffman offers several explanations. Uh, one major contribution is the emergence of anti-vaccine sentiment was the famous publication by Andrew Wakefield, a British, a, a British gastroenterologist, uh, as I'm sure many of you know from the past, uh, of the, in an article in The Lancet that associated the MMR vaccine, the measles, uh, mumps, and rubella vaccine, uh, with autism. So that study, which was widely discussed and apparently accepted in both countries to a very substantial extent, but it was uh, subsequently totally discredited and withdrawn, but that hasn't totally eliminated the reactions that people make, which has been considerable vaccine uh, hesitancy. So, the rest of the discussion uh, focuses on the event on events in the USA. So, according to the writer Hoffman, um, scientists now report that science has lost its platform. So, the idea is that the constituents who make up the so-called vaccine, who are called vaccine resistant, come from D disparate groups, including anti-government libertarians, uh, apostles of the all-natural, and those who believe that doctors should not dictate medical decisions about children. So in a very different vein, she reports that the sense among some health experts that parents and even many doctors do not appreciate the severity of disease that immunizations have thwarted because they've not seen actual cases. So they don't really have, they haven't experienced these cases. Um, and, and that's why they're, they're being misled. Thus, vaccines are a victim of their own success, in a sense. Another strong strain in Hoffman's explanation of the rise of vaccine resistance is group think parenting facilitated by social media. So it's obvious that all of these are complicated phenomena. Obviously we're not gonna, we don't have time to go into all of these or any of them in detail, but just to give you a flavor, I'm sure much of this is familiar to many of you, uh, but um, just to get a flavor of what might be going on in a change and what used to be taken as uh, the word of experts who are to be trusted and, and now there's a level of distrust which is problematic uh, in a world, uh, in a world uh, context. 
Uh, a different kind of explanation offered is failure to understand numerical risk. We pay more attention to numerals such as 16 of, uh, adverse events than we do denominators, denominators such as per million vaccine doses. So they're not as uh, over, they're more overwhelmed by a certain number because the number seems large uh, even though when you consider a number relative to how many children are being born and so on, uh, that that number is not taken as, as significantly as it should be. So the fact that there are sometimes adverse effects when taking, uh, taking uh, such things, that that's not, that shouldn't be indicated that uh, the, the doctors are wrong. These points may reasonably be cl classified as mistakes that certain parents are making. But admittedly, there are other factors that certainly shouldn't be counted as mistakes, at least not by the, the, the parents in question. One such factor is the lack of trust in big pharma. Nobody can deny that humongous guilt of big pharma, especially with regards to Purdue's highly culpable role in the opioid catastrophe. So it's certainly true that there can be evidence of some, some category of people or actions that um, may be considered done by people who are experts, but nonetheless, in virtue of self-interests, have done things that had horrendous uh, impact. So one can't say that you should never, you should just trust uh, somebody who purports to be an expert. Uh, that, that would not be a fair representation of the situation uh, we have lived in and probably will go on living. Now most of the foregoing discussion has focused on a relatively narrow program a, pr a narrow problem about expertise, namely how laypersons can tell uh, which of self, a, two, a pair of uh, self-styled uh, experts is the better one. Uh, but the ones we've just talked about now uh, have to do with groups and uh, how they go about uh, possibly influencing one another. Uh, I, I sort of skipped uh, some of the, the factors about influence uh, within certain groups, for example, but, but I won't, uh, we don't have time for everything. So um, th this is a, a survey then of some of the literature that I think we should want to think about and reflect on in uh, both kinds of cases, individual seekers and uh, or people seeking individual oriented uh, ex experts and others when you have group groups that um, ha have similar sorts of issues. So, um, so I, I've skipped over some others also. That, so we could talk about experts in, in public life, in various parts of public life, which I have in my manuscript here, but we don't have time, I think, to pursue it. Um, so, uh, we can talk about, for example, global warming. We could talk about, well, th there are a lot of topics to talk about. And uh, many of these issues uh, arise uh, with similar problems, perhaps. So let me turn uh, to a general conclusion that I'm inclined to, inclined to draw here. So how should individual novices and public uh, organizations of various types utilize or respond to experts? I should have said that in the parts I'm omitting here, we can talk about the use of experts uh, as opposed to laypersons uh, in making decisions in education. Uh, we can talk about the role of experts in, uh, in uh, political life and how much experts, how big a role experts should play as opposed to ordinary citizens. That's also a big issue that's been raised in connection with expert. So there are a lot of other issues here 
that I've just mentioned now, but we haven't gone into in detail. But let me draw uh, what I take to be a reasonable approach to this group of phenomena. So how should, in, so the question is, how should individual novices and also public organizations of various types utilize or respond to experts and their role in these various uh, enterprises or processes? Um, so here's a, a general principle here uh, that a philosopher might, might not be surprised to have a philosopher uh, put forward. So knowledge, and by knowledge I mean believing a, true, a, pr a proposition uh, that is true, so true belief is what constitutes knowledge. Well, epistemologists would not be happy with it quite that simple, uh, but it's good enough for present purposes, I think, for, certainly for illustration. Uh, so that's an essential part of life, uh, using your knowledge uh, and also getting benefit from that knowledge. So knowledge plays a crucial role in achieving one's ends and in avoiding mishaps and catastrophes. So a simple example, here's a simple example which I'll call example one. This doesn't involve expertise yet, this example. So, Suppose uh, a pedestrian is crossing the street uh, with a speedy car or truck bearing down on him. That's the fact of the matter. If uh, it is very helpful, well, let's see here. I got to get the next page rather than two pages later. Okay, if the pedestrian acquires the true belief that there is such a vehicle, acquires it quickly enough, bearing down on him, he may be able to escape a disaster. But if he's ignorant of what is happening, obviously disaster may befall him. So knowledge is critical. I mean, that's a trivial case in which what you know or don't know can have a momentous effect on your life. Obvious. Now here's a, another simple example, number two, uh, and this does involve expertise. So, but again, it's a very simple example. So Charlie is visiting a new city, and he loves Chinese food, but he doesn't know where Chinese, these good Chinese restaurants that are really good, um, he doesn't know where to find them. He doesn't know, and he doesn't know how good they are, even if he's heard their, their name. So he asks his friend Sam, who purports to be an expert in Chinese cuisine. So let's suppose that Sam recommends Sichuan Kitchen. Okay? Suppose now that Sam really is an expert in Chinese cuisine and uh, that he also has Charlie's pleasure at heart. Okay? So his knowledge and, and, and Charlie knows this, so Charlie trusts him, and his knowledge, uh, that knowledge, is very helpful. So Charlie trusts Sam's uh, expertise and accordingly um, gets a good upshot. The result is very satisfying. So in this case, relying on an expert works. I mean, trivial example, similar things happen all the time, but they, they illustrate a point about how important knowledge is, or, or by that we mean true belief. And, um, and so I think that's a, a very common fact of life, but of course um, it doesn't always work that way. And it might not work that way because the, the recommendation isn't a, an honest and truthful one or just simply random error. So I'm not so, so what I'm saying from this is that it often helps to pinpoint experts and use what they say, that is when they convey their beliefs. Of course, I'm not saying that trusting people who purport to be, who purport to be experts always has a happy ending. Trusting the work of Andrew Wakefield was 
during the period that it lasted, was clearly an unhappy event, unhappy event. And I would submit, ignoring the advice of the great, um, of the great consensus among uh, climate scientists would also be a devastating um, result if you, if, if you don't heed that advice from experts. Um, putative experts are not always genuine experts. They don't always have the knowledge and skills they purport to have, but when they do, it will be the loss of others who fail to follow them. So the best of an ex so even the best expert, of course, can sometimes be wrong. But since we've defined an expert as someone who has more knowledge than the average person in the relevant domain, having consulting an expert and going by their say-so as to what's the case may often be, I won't say always, but will often be a good route, just like consulting the experts on Chinese food. So putative experts are not always genuine experts as they claim to be, and even the best expert can be, of course, wrong. Despite this, however, wisdom does not suggest total rejection of experts or expertise, as some thinkers have recommended. Now there's a literature, uh, I think largely an old, oldish literature, that heavily doubts uh, the value or even existence of such a thing as an, as an expert. There's still people who say there, is, there ain't any such thing as truth, and so there can't be anything like expertise and other similar things. So I'm dubious about all of that. So I haven't gone over that literature. That would be quite a digression. But OK, here's maybe a similar case. I don't really know. Um, so I'm told that the Bridges had, recently that the British Education Secretary, Michael Gove, recently wrote in The Guardian, we are all sick of expertise. Sorry, we are all sick of experts. Well, uh, I don't know if this is common, uh, a common British attitude toward experts. I'm a little inclined to doubt it. Uh, but we find somebody saying that, and he's not alone, at least if you look back historically at the literature uh, on expertise. But I very much doubt that it's a wise, state, uh, wise stance to take. I'll leave it at that. <laughs>